Welcome to Kong's Corner, the show where I try to grow my hands by straining really hard. I actually got really dizzy there. Whoa, I'm back. Actually, it's a show where I read Harry Potter for the very first time. I've never read it before. Please don't spoil anything in the chat or in the comments because it's my first time and you'll steal my joy of discovery if you do. Uh, so, last time we left off with uh, Dumbledore having shown Harry a lot from uh, Tom Riddle's past. It was pretty intense. He went around murdering his parents and other people just willy-nilly. You're dead! You're dead! You're dead! Uh, and got something called a Horcrux, whatever that may be. Um, so I'm excited to maybe find out this time what it is. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Um, I'm using a different mic today because, once again, I had some kind of, out of nowhere, mic troubles. So that's it. I'm buying a new mic next month. That's what I'm doing. I'm going to try and buy a new mic to save up, see if I have the, the cachola for it. Because this is ridiculous. It's getting out of hand. Okay, let's just get started, shall we? I, I had a nice day. Oh, today, uh, I w was walking with Dexter and I ran into Kelly, <laughs> which is so rad. She, you'll see her often in the chat. So, uh, good, good seeing you. Good running into you. And I think it's somebody's birthday today. Josh Z. Josh Z. It's your birthday. Josh Z. It's your birthday. I hope you have lots of fun friends and birthday presents like a pony. Uh, that was a five out of ten, but I gave it my best shot, Josh. All right. Let's get going. Julia, first time here, welcome. Love having you here. Okay, so we are right in the middle of um, Slughorn's class, and Slughorn was the one who, uh, I'm, we're assuming, we're assuming, taught Tom Riddle what a Horcrux is, or I guess how to perform a Horcrux, or whatever that is. And Harry got his first mission from his main man through and through Dumbledore. Dumbledore gave him his first mission is to get get sneak into Slughorn's good wills and get the story out of him. I'm gonna excited to see what kind of uh, acting Harry's gonna get up to. All right, everybody, let's go. They're in the middle of the class. Uh, but before Harry could answer, Slughorn was calling for silence from the front of the room. Settle down, settle down, please. Quickly, nay. Lots of work to get through this afternoon. Gold, uh, gold, gold Pilot's third law? Who can tell me? But Miss Granger can. Oh, we already got this. Okay, so <laughs> they're just going through Gold Pilot's law, the confusing thing there. I was so baffled by it. We ended at the end of his explanation of what gold, gold Pilot's law is. Okay, so we'll go from there. Ron was sitting beside Harry with his mouth half open, doodling absently on his new copy of Advanced Potion Making. Ron kept forgetting that he could no longer rely on Hermione to help him out of trouble when he failed to grasp what was going on. And so, finished Slughorn, I want each of you to come and take one of these files from a desk. You are to create an antidote for the poison within it before the end of the lesson. Good luck, and don't forget your protective gloves. Hermione had her left stool. Hermione had left her stool. Not Hermione had her left stool. She had her stool and both of her left and right hands like, Anybody want some poop? <laughs> when you gotta go, it's toilet time. Who wants some poop? It's toilet time. Um... Hermione had left her stool and was halfway towards Slughorn's desk before the rest of the class had realized it was time to move. And by the time Harry, Ron, and Ernie returned to the table, she had already tipped the contents... I don't know what music is playing, but I'm going to change it. Into her file, of her file, into her cauldron, and was kindling a fire underneath it. Uh, welcome back, Romana! Welcome, welcome, welcome. Glad to have you back. 
Um, it's a shame that the prince won't be able to help you much with this, Harry, she said brightly as she straightened up. You have to understand the principles involved this time. No shortcuts or cheats. Annoyed, Harry uncorked the poison he had taken from Slughorn's desk, which was a, a garish shade of pink, tipped it into his cauldron and lit a fire underneath it. He did not have the faintest idea what he was supposed to do next. He glanced at Ron, who was now standing there looking rather gormless, great word, having copied everything Harry had done. You sure the prince hasn't got any tips? Ron muttered to Harry. Harry pulled out his trusty copy of Advanced Potion Making and turned to the chapter on Antidotes. There was Gal Palat's third law, stated word for word as Hermione had recited it, but not a single illuminating note in the prince's hand to explain what it meant. Apparently, the prince, like Hermione, had had no difficulty understanding it. Nothing, said Harry gloomily. Hermione was now waving her wand enthusiastically over her cauldron. Unfortunately, they could not copy the spell she was doing because she was now so good at non-verbal incantations that she did not need to say the words aloud. Ernie Macmillan, however, was muttering, Specialist Revealio over his cauldron, which sounded impressive, so Harry and Ron hastened to imitate him. Uh, let me know in the chat. Did, did you ever cheat in high school, or if you're currently in high school, did you ever cheat? I was such a bad student. Me, and my, like I would do my buddies. I was in Germany. I would do my buddies' English homework, and he would do my math homework. Uh, just to let you know, I did this kind of stuff all the time. But I was also a really bad student, so it doesn't work. Just so you know, if you're currently in school, do not take my example. I was so bad. I, I almost repeated classes so many times. I didn't, but there was three years in a row where I almost had to repeat. So I was such a bad student. I was a brat. I was a brat. I still am. <laughs> it took Harry only five minutes to realize that his reputation as the best potion maker in the class was crashing around his ears. Slughorn appeared hopefully into his cauldron on his first circuit of the dungeon, preparing to exclaim in delight, as he usually did, and instead had withdrawn his head hastily, coughing, as the smell of bad eggs overwhelmed him. I'm scandalized I cheated more in elementary than I think we all cheated at least once. <laughs> I was who people cheated off of, yeah. <laughs> Hermione's expression could not have been any smugger, she had loathed being outperformed in every potions class. She was now decan decanting the mysteriously se separated ingredients of her poison into ten different crystal files, vials. More to avoid watching this irritating sight than anything else, Harry bent over the half-blood prince's book and turned a few pages with unnecessary force. And there it was, scrawled right across a long list of antidotes. Just shove a bezoar down their throats. B-E-Z-O-A-R. What is that? Harry stared at these words for a moment. Hadn't he once, long ago, heard of bezoars? Hadn't Snape mentioned them in their first ever potions lesson? A stone taken from the stomach of a goat, which will protect from most poisons. It was not an answer to the Galpalot problem, and... Had Snape still been their teacher, Harry would not have dared to do it. But this was a moment for desperate measures. He hastened towards the store cupboard and rummaged within it, pushing aside unicorn horns and tangles of dried herbs until he found, at the very back, a small card box on which had been scribbled the word Bazaars. He opened the box just as Slughorn called, uh, Two minutes left, everyone! Inside were half a dozen shriveled brown objects, looking more like dried up kidneys than real stones. Uh, my cheating was never found out, probably because I was already known as a great student. Oh, you're lucky. You are lucky. You are indeed saying bazaars correctly. Awesome. Thank you very much. I cheated once, felt so sick, I almost confessed. You have a good heart, <laughs> Ragnild. <laughs> oh man, you have a good heart. <laughs> good heart. Good hearts. Multiples. Um, he put one back in the cupboard and hurried back to his cauldron. Time's up, called Slughorn genially. Well, let's see how you've done. Blaze, what have you got for me? Slowly, Slughorn moved around the room, examining the various antidotes. 
Nobody had finished the task, although Hermione was trying to cram a few more ingredients into her bottle before Slughorn reached her. Ron had given up completely and was merely trying to avoid breathing in the putrid fumes issuing from his cauldron. Harry stood there waiting, the bazaar clutched in a slightly sweaty hand. Slughorn reached their table last. He sniffed Ernie's potion and passed on to Ron's with a grimace. He did not linger over Ron's cauldron, but backed away swiftly, retching slightly. <laughs> and you, Harry, he said, what have you got to show me? Harry held out his hand, the bazaar sitting in his palm. Slughorn looked down at it for a full ten seconds. Harry wondered for a moment whether he was going to shout at him. Then he threw back his head and roared with laughter. How does he laugh? <laughs> <laughs> you got nerve, boy! He boomed, taking the bazaar and holding up so that the class could see it. <laughs> <laughs> You're like your mother. Well, I can't fault you. A bazaar would certainly act as an antidote to all these potions. <laughs> Hermione, who was sweaty faced and had soot on her nose, looked livid. Her half finished antidote, comprising 52 ingredients, including a chunk of her own hair, bubbled sluggishly behind Slughorn, who had eyes for nobody but Harry. Oh, Harry. Yeah, I've got the most special poison. Antidote. Harry. Um, someone call 911. <laughs> Let this team get laughing. Uh, oh no, and people didn't like that. People didn't like the slug or romance. <laughs> he didn't have eyes for anybody but Harry. And you uh, uh, and you thought of a bezel all by yourself, did you, Harry? She asked through gritted teeth. I'm gonna try and do that through gr gritted teeth. And you thought of a bezel all by yourself, did you, furry? That's the individual spirit a real potion maker needs, said Slughorn happily, before Harry could reply, <laughs> Just like his mother, she had the same intuitive grasp of potion making. It's undoubtedly from Lily, he gets it. Yes, Harry, yes. If you've got a bezoar to hand, of course that will do the trick. Although, as they don't work on everything, and are pretty rare, it's still worth Still worth knowing how to, how to mix antidotes. The only person in the room looking angrier than Hermione was Malfoy, who Harry was pleased to see had spilled something that looked like cat sick over himself. Before either of them could express their fury that Harry had come to top of the class by not doing any work, however, the bell rang. Is Hermione upset Harry's learning things from books? Like, what's that's what you do? True. True. Chat disconnected. Please wait while we try to reconnect you. Oh, just the chat. Hm. I got excellent connection, so it's something happened with YouTube. Uh, time to pack up, said Slughorn. And an extra ten points to Gryffindor for, cheer, for, for sheer cheek. Still chuckling, he waddled back to his desk at the front of the dungeon. Harry dawdled behind taking an antidote in or inordinate amount of time to do up his bag. Neither Ron nor Hermione wished him luck as they left. Both looked rather annoyed. At last, Harry and Slughorn were the only two left in the room. Come on now, Harry. You'll be late for your next lesson, said Slughorn affably, snapping the gold clasps shut on his dragonskin briefcase. Uh, sir, said Harry, reminding himself irresistibly of Voldemort. Oh, Voldemort, I can't stop thinking about you. Voldemort, bring down your hawk cracks upon me. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you something. People are hating that. <laughs> uh, ask away then, my dear boy, ask away. Sir, I, I wondered what you know about 
about Horcruxes? Slughorn froze. His round face seemed to sink in upon itself. He licked his lips and said hoarsely, What did you say? I asked whether you know anything about Horcruxes, sir. You see, Dumbledore put you up to this, whispered Slughorn. His voice had changed completely. Okay. Dumbledore put you up to this, whispered Slughorn. His voice had changed completely. It was not genial anymore, but shocked, terrified. He fumbled in his breast pocket and pulled out a handkerchief, mopping his sweating brow. Dumbledore sh shown you that, that memory, said Slughorn. Well, hasn't he? Yes, said Harry, deciding on the spot that it was best not to lie. Yes, of course, said Slughorn quietly, still dabbing at his white face. Of course. Well, if you've seen that memory, Harry, you'll know that I don't know anything. Anything, he repeated the word forcefully, about Horcruxes. He seized his dragonskin briefcase, stuffed his handkerchief back into his pocket, and marched to the dungeon door. Sir, said Harry desperately, I just thought there might be a bit more to the memory. Did ya? said Slughorn. Then you were... Then you, uh, then you were wrong, weren't you? Wrong! He bellowed the last word, and before Harry could say another word, slammed the dungeon door behind him. Neither Ron nor Hermione was at all sympathetic when Harry told them of this disastrous interview. Yeah, that, that was not really well done, Harry. Hermione was still seething at the way Harry had triumphed without doing the work properly. Ron was resentful that Harry had slipped him a bezoar, too. It would have just looked stupid if we'd both done it, said Harry irritably. Look, I had to try and soften him up so I could ask him about Voldemort, didn't I? Oh, will you get a grip? He added in exasperation as Ron winced at the sound of the name. <laughs> Infuriated by his failure and by Ron and Hermione's attitudes, Harry brooded for the next few days over what to do next about Slughorn. He decided that, for the time being, he would let Slughorn think that he had forgotten all about Horcruxes. It was surely best to lull him into a false sense of security before returning to the attack. Harry has been so dumb in this try. Shame! True, Fred. Uh, he'd not be alive to tell a tale if he tried that with Snape. True. <laughs> Welcome, Jenny Cope. Even better late than never. Um... When Harry did not question Slughorn again, the potions master reverted to his usual affection treatment of him and appeared to have put the matter from his mind. Harry awaited an invitation to one of his little evening parties, determined to accept this time, even if he had to reschedule Quidditch practice. Unfortunately, however, 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 no such invitation arrived. Harry checked with Hermione and Ginny. Neither of them had received an invitation, and nor, as far as they knew, had anybody else. Harry could not help wondering whether this meant that Slughorn was not quite as forgetful as he appeared, simply determined to give, to, give, give Harry no additional opportunity to question him. Meanwhile, the Hogwarts library had failed Hermione for the first time in living memory. She was so shocked, she even forgot that she was annoyed at Harry for his trick with a bezoar. Because the library is the all-holy for her. I haven't found one single explanation of what Horcruxes do, she told him. Not a single one. I've been right through the restricted section, and even in the most horrible books, where they tell you how to brew the most gruesome potions. Nothing. All I could find was this. In the introduction to Magic Most Evile, listen. Of the Horcrux, wickedest of magical inventions, we shall not speak nor give direction. I mean... Why mention it then? She said impatiently, slamming the old book shut. It let out a ghostly wail. Oh, oh, shut up, she snapped, stuffing it back into her bag. The snow melted around the school as February, February, <laughs> the R words are not, I'm not connecting with those today. <laughs> Hello from Argentina, says Fl uh, Fl Florencia, or Fl Florencia. Sorry if I mispronounced, but hello back. Uh, the snow melted around the school as February arrived. Got it. 
to be replaced by cold, dreary wetness. Purplish gray clouds hung low over the castle, and a constant fall of chilly rain made the lawn slippery and muddy. The upshot of this was that the sixth year's first apparition lesson, which was scheduled for a Saturday morning so that no normal lessons would be missed, took place in the great hall instead of the grounds. When Harry and Hermione arrived at the hall, Ron had come down with lavender, they found that the tables had disappeared. Maybe they've disappeared. <gasps> Rain lashed against the high windows, and the enchanted ceiling swirled darkly above them as they, f they assembled in front of Professor McGonagall, Snape, Flitwick, and Sprout, the heads of house, and a small wizard whom Harry took to be the apparition instructor from the Ministry. Okay, so I don't know who this person is. I probably get some kind of description of him, but just give me some adjectives, nothing else. Just adjectives who this person would be based on the books, not on the movies, please. Um, he was oddly colorless, okay, kind of color seeped out, with transparent eyelashes, wispy hair, and an insubstantial air, as though a single gust of wind might blow him away. Okay, so very kind of frail, transparent, colorless. Harry wondered whether constant disappearances and reappearances had somehow diminished his substance, or whether this frail build was for anyone wishing to vanish. Quiet, Unremar unremarkable, quiet. Okay. Morning, right, something like that. Good morning, said the ministry wizard, when all the students had arrived and the house heads of house had called for quiet. My name is Wilkie Twycross, and I shall be your ministry apparition instructor for the next twelve weeks. I hope to be able to prepare you for your apparition test in this time. Malfoy, be quiet and pay attention, barked Professor McGonagall. Everybody looked around. Mal Does that work for that character? Malfoy had flushed a dull pink. He looked furious as he stepped away from Crabbe, with whom he appeared to have been having a whispered argument. Harry glanced quickly at Snape, who also looked annoyed. Though Harry strongly suspected this was less because of Malfoy's rudeness than the fact that McGonagall had reprimanded one of his house. The voice is good. Great. Good. Um, <clears throat> you have to listen hard to catch what he says. Okay, so I'll, I'll bring that voice a bit higher. Um, Twycross. It's also a great name. By which time many of you may be ready to take your test. Twycross continued, as though there had been no interruption. As you may know, it is usually impossible to apparate or disapparate within Hogwarts. The headmaster has lifted this enchantment purely within the Great Hall for one hour, so as to enable you to practice. May I emphasize that you will not be able to apparate outside the walls of this hall, and that you would be unwise to try. I would like each of you to place yourselves now so that you have a clear five feet of space in front of you. There was a great scrambling and jostling as people separated, banging into each other, and ordered others out of their space. The heads of house moved among the students, Marshalling them into position and breaking up the voice rocks. The voice is a little creepy. COVID, five feet of space. Um, and breaking up arguments. Harry, where, where are you going? Demanded Hermione. But Harry did not answer. He was moving quickly through the crowd, past the place where Professor Sl Flitwick was making squeaky attempts to position a few Ravenclaws, all of whom wanted to be near, near the front past Professor Sprout, who was shivying the Hufflepuffs into line, until, by dodging around Ernie McMillan, he managed to position himself right at the back of the crowd, directly behind Malfoy, who was taking advantage of the general upheaval to continue his argument with Crabbe, standing five feet away and looking mutinous. Um, I don't know how much longer, all right? Malfoy shot at him, oblivious to Harry standing right behind him. It's taking longer than I thought it would. Crabbe opened his mouth, 
but Malfoy appeared to second guess what he was going to say. Look, it's none of your business what I'm doing, Crabbe. You and Goyel just do as you're told and keep a lookout. I tell my friends what I'm up to if I want them to keep a lookout for me, Harry said, just loud enough for Malfoy to hear him. Why would it give away that he's standing behind him? What a dumb move. Malfoy spun round on the spot, his hand flying to his wand, but at that precise moment, the four heads of the house shouted, Quiet! 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 And silence fell again. Malfoy turned slow to, to face the front. Thank you, said Tw Twycross. Now then, he waved his wand. Old-fashioned wooden hoops instantly appeared on the floor in front of every student. The most important things to remember when apparating are the three D's, said Twycross. Destination, determination, deliberation. Step one, fix your mind firmly upon the desired destination, said Twycross. In this case, the interior of your hoop kindly Concentrate upon that dest destination now. Everyone looked around furtively to check that everyone else was staring into their hoop, then hastily did as they were told. Harry gazed at the circular patch of dusty floor enclosed by his hoop and tried to think of nothing else. This proved impossible, as he couldn't stop puzzling over what Malfoy was doing that needed lookouts. And again, we will never hear Karabe's voice. Yeah, it's a bit annoying, hey? <laughs> Step two, said Twy Twycross. Focus your determination to occupy the visualized space. Ah! Ah! <laughs> he just loses. He loses his crap. Let your yearning to enter it Flood from your mind to every particle of your body. Harry glanced around sur surreptitiously. A little way to his left, Ernie McMillan was contemplating his hoop so hard that his face had turned pink. It looked as though he were straining to lay a quaffled sized egg. Oh, I'm going to be a father! Harry bit back a laugh and hastily returned his gaze to his own hoop. Step Three, called Twycross, and only when I give you the command, command, turn on the spot, feeling your way into nothingness, moving with deliberation on my command. Now, one. Harry glanced around again. Lots of people were looking positively alarmed at being asked to operate so quickly. Two. Harry tried to fix his thoughts on his hoop again. He had already forgotten what the three D stood for. Three! Harry spun on the spot, lost his balance, and nearly fell over. He was not the only one. The whole hall was suddenly full of staggering people. Neville was flat on his back. Ernie McMillan, on the other hand, had done a kind of pirouetting leap into his hoop and looked momentarily thrilled until he caught sight of Dean Thomas roaring with laughter at him. Never mind, never mind, said Twycross dryly, who did not seem to have expected anything better. Adjust your hoops, please, and back to your original positions. The second attempt was no better than the first. The third was just as bad. Not until the fourth did anything exciting happen. There was a horrible screech of pain, and everybody looked around, terrified, to see Susan Bones of Hufflepuff wobbling in her hoop with her left leg still standing five feet away, away from where she had s just started. A oh, poor Susan Bones. She's consistently getting it, huh? Man. The heads of house converged on her. There was a great bang and a puff of purple smoke which cleared to reveal Susan sobbing, reunited with her leg but looking horrified. Splinching, or the separation of random body parts, said Wilcom Twycross dispassionately, dispassionately, okay. Occurs when the mind is 
insufficiently determined. You must concentrate continually upon your destination and move without haste, but with deliberation. Thus, Twycross stepped forwards, turned gracefully on the spot with his arms outstretched, and vanished in a swirl of robes, reappearing at the back of the hall. Remember the three Ds, he said, and try again. One, two, three. <coughs> Uh, but an hour later, Susan's splinching was still the most interesting thing that had happened. Twycross did not seem discouraged. Fastening his cloak at his neck, he merely said, Until next Saturday, everyone. And do not forget. Destination. Determination. Deliberation. With that, he waved his wand, vanishing the hoops, and walked out of the hall accompanied by Professor McGonagall. Talk broke out at once as people began moving towards the entrance hall. How did you do? Asked Ron, hurrying towards Harry. I think I felt something last time I tried. A kind of tingling in my feet. Um, I expect your trainers are too small. One, one, said a voice behind them. I like this sass. And Hermione stalked past, smirking. <laughs> I didn't feel anything, said Harry, ignoring this interruption. But I don't care about that now. What do you mean you don't care? Don't you want to learn to operate? Said Ron incredulously. I'm not fussed, really. I prefer flying, said Harry, glancing over his shoulder to see where Malfoy was, and speeding up as they came into the entrance hall. Look, hurry up, will you? There's something I want to do. Perplexed, Ron followed Harry back to Gryffindor Tower at a wrong. Splinch. Splinch is a good word. Yeah. Um, they were temporarily detained by Peeves. Love my Peeves. Cock! I got your cock! Who had jammed a door on the fourth floor shut and was refusing to let anyone pass until they set fire to their own pants. Yes! That's why I love this guy. But Harry and Ron simply turned back and took one of their trusted shortcuts. Within five minutes, they were climbing through the porthole. Are you going to tell me what we're doing then? Asked Ron, panting slightly. Up here, said Harry. And he crossed the common room and led the way through the door to the boys' staircase. Their dormitory was, as Harry had hoped, empty. He flung open his trunk and began to rummage in it, while Ron watched impatiently. Harry, Malfoy's using Crabbe and Goyel as lookouts. He was arguing with Crabbe just now. I want to know... Aha! He had found it. A folded square of apparently blank parchment, which he now smoothed out and tapped with the tip of his wand. I solemnly swear that I am up to no good. Or well, Malfoy is, anyway. At once the Mara Marauder's map opened on the parchment's surface. Here was a detailed plan of every one of the castle's floor floors, and moving around it, the tiny labeled black dots that signified each of the castle's occupants. Um, good morning again from Australia. Welcome, Bryce. Um, help me find Malfoy, said Harry urgently. He laid the map upon his bed, and he and Ron leaned over it, searching. There, said Ron, after a minute or so. He's in the Slytherin common room. Look! with Parkinson and Zabini and Crabbe and Goyel. Harry looked down at the map, disappointed, but rallied almost at once. Well, I'm keeping an eye on him for, from now on, he said firmly, and the moment I see him lurking somewhere with Crabbe and Goyel, keep, keeping watch outside, it'll be, on with, it'll be on with the old invisibility cloak and off to find out what he's... He broke off as Neville entered the dormitory, bringing with him a strong smell of singed material, and began rummaging in his trunk for a fresh pair of pants. He's so good for a joke. He's so funny. Despite his determination... <laughs> I, just don't, I just love him. I love Neville. Uh, he's so lovable. Despite his determination to catch Malfoy out, 
Harry had no luck at all over the next couple of weeks. Although he consulted the map as often as he could, sometimes making unnecessary visits to the bathroom between lessons to search it, he did not once see Malfoy anywhere. Suspicious. Admittedly, he spotted Crabbe and Goyel moving around the castle on their own more often than usual, sometimes remaining stationary in deserted corridors. But at these times, Malfoy was not only nowhere near them, but impossibly to locate on the map at all. This was most mysterious. Harry toyed with the possibility that Malfoy, Malfoy was actually leaving the school grounds, but could not see how he could be doing it, given the very high level of security now operating within the castle. He could only suppose that he was missing Malfoy among, uh, amongst the hundreds of tiny black dots upon the map. As for the fact that Mal Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyel appeared to be going their different ways when they were usually inseparable, these things, these things happened as people got older. Ron and Hermione, Harry reflected sadly, were living proof. This is the Harry Potter version of online stalking. Ha! <laughs> Very true. <laughs> oh my god, Harry, why are you so obsessed with me? Said Draco. February moved towards March, with no change in the weather except that it became windy as well as wet. To general indignation, a sign went up on all common room notice boards that the next trip into Hogsmeade had been cancelled. Ron was furious. It was on my birthday, he said. I was looking forward to that. Not a big surprise though, is it? said Harry. Not after what they did to Katie. She had still not returned from St. Mungo's. What was more, further disappearances had been reported in the Daily Prophet, including several relatives of students at Hogwarts. But now all I've got to look forward to is stupid apparition, said Ron grumpily. Big birthday treat. Three lessons on, apparition was proving as difficult as ever, though few more people had managed to splinch themselves. Frustration was running high, and there was a certain amount of ill feeling towards Wilkie Twycross and his three Ds, which had inspired a number of nicknames for him, the politest of which were Dog Breath and Dung Head. I know where I know what she is trying to uh, um, uh, refer to there. Happy birthday, Ron said Harry, when they were working on the first of March by Seamus and Dean leaving noisily for breakfast. Have a present. He threw the package across onto Ron's bed, where it joined a small pile of them that must, Harry assumed, have been delivered by house elves in the night. <sighs> Cheers, said Ron drowsily, as he ri and as he ripped off the paper Harry got out of bed, opened his own trunk, and began rummaging in it for the Marauder's map, which he hid after every use. He turfed out half the contents of his trunk before he found it, hiding beneath the rolled-up socks, in which he was still keeping his bottle of lucky potion. Felix Felicis 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 Felicis? Right, he murmured, taking it back to bed with him, tapping it quietly and murmuring, I solemnly swear that I'm up to no good, so that Neville, who was passing the foot of his bed at the time, would not hear. Who cares? Isn't Neville part of your group now? <laughs> nice one, Harry, said Ron enthusiastically, waving the new pair of Quidditch Keeper's gloves Harry had given him. Felicis. 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 Okay. Felicis. Um. Sorry, where were we? Oh, yeah. Uh, no problem, said Harry absentmindedly, as he searched the Slytherin dormitory close closely for Mal Malfoy. Hey, I, I don't think he's in his bed. Ron did not answer. He was too busy unwrapping presents, every now and then letting out an ex exclamation of pleasure. Oh, seriously good haul this year, he announced, holding up a heavy gold watch with odd symbols around the edge and tiny moving stars instead of hands. See what mum and dad got me? Oh, blimey! I think I'll come of age next year too. Cool, muttered Harry. Sparing the watch a glance before peering more closely at the map. Where was Malfoy? He did not seem to be at the Slytherin table in the Great Hall, eating breakfast. He was nowhere near Snape, who was sitting in his study. 
He wasn't in any of the bathrooms or in the hospital wing. Want one? Said Ron thickly, holding out a box of chocolate cauldrons. Oh, that sounds delicious. Uh, uh, no thanks, said Harry, looking up. Malfoy's gone again. Can't have done, said Ron, stuffing a second cauldron into his mouth as he slid out of bed to get dressed. Come on, if you don't hurry up, you'll have to apparate on an empty stomach. Might make it easier, I suppose. Ron looked thoughtfully at the box of chocolate cauldrons and shrugged and helped himself to a third. Ron is me. I am Ron. I, I am Ron. Uh... <laughs> Harry tapped the map with his wand, muttered, mischief managed, though it hadn't been, and got dressed, thinking hard. There had to be an explanation for Malfoy's periodic disappearances, but he simply could not think what it could be. The best way of finding out would be to tail him, but even with the invisibility cloak, this was an impractical idea. He had lessons, Quidditch practice, Homework and apparition. He could not follow Malfoy around school all day without his absence being remarked on. Ready? He said to Ron. He was halfway to the dormitory door when he realized that Ron had not moved but was leaning on his bedpost, staring out of the rain-washed window with a strangely unfocused look on his face. Ron? Breakfast? I'm not hungry. Harry stared at him. I... Oh, you just said. Well, all right. I'll come down with you, sighed Ron. Don't want to eat. Harry scrutinized him suspiciously. You've just eaten half a box of chocolate cauldrons, haven't you? Not that, Ron sighed again. You... You wouldn't understand. Fair enough, said Harry, albeit puzzled. Albeit puzzled as he turned to open the door. Harry, said Ron suddenly. What? Harry, I can't stand it! You can't stand what? asked Harry, now starting to feel definitely alarmed. Ron was ra rather pale and looked as though he was about to be sick. I can't stop thinking about her, said Ron hoarsely. He is just love-struck. Oh, man. It's just like, ah! <laughs> Harry gaped at him. He had not expected this and was not sure he wanted to hear it. Friends they might be, but if Ron started calling Lavender Lav Lav, he would have to put his foot down. Why does that stop you having breakfast? Harry asked, trying to inject a note of common sense into the proceedings. I don't think she knows I exist, said Ron with a desperate gesture. He... Definitely knows you exist, said Harry, bewildered. He keeps snogging you, doesn't she? Ron blinked. Who are you talking about? Who are you talking about? said Harry, with an increasing sense that all reason had dropped out of the conversation. Ramilda Vane. Ah, you absolute dork! Ron. Ron's an... an... Uh, he's an... Utter blockhead. Ah, what a. <clears throat> said Ron softly. And who, who is she again? Who's Ramilda Vane again? I can't even remember who that is. Ah, uh, and his whole face didn't seem to illuminate as he said it, as though hit by a ray of purest sunlight. They stared at each other for almost a whole minute before Harry said, This is a joke, right? You're joking. I think... Harry, I think I love her, said Ron in a strangled voice. Okay, said Harry, walking up to Ron to get a better look at the glazed eyes and the pallid complexion. O okay, say that again with a straight face. I love her, repeated Ron breathlessly. 
you seen her hair? It's all black and shiny and silky. And her eyes, her big dark eyes and, and her... This is really funny and everything, said Harry impatiently, but joke's over, all right? Uh, drop it. He turned to leave. He got two steps towards the door when a crashing blow hit him on the right ear. Staggering, he looked around. Ron's fist was drawn right back. His face was contorted with rage. He was about to strike again. Say what? What? I definitely didn't mean to hit that one. I meant to hit this one. <laughs> oh, I think I know what's going on. Romilda Vane gave him a potion. As part of the chocolates. There's a chocolate cauldron, and she put that love potion into it. That's what happened. That is my, uh... From an idiot, idiot, Ah. Uh. Yep, she got him. She got him. He, um, he, he punched Harry. Harry reacted instinctively. His wand was out of his pocket, and the incantation sprang to his mind without conscious thought. Levi corpus! Ron yelled as his heel was wrenched upward once more. He dangled helplessly, upside down, his robes hanging off him. What was that for? Harry bellowed. You insulted her, Harry! You said it was a joke! R shouted Ron, who was slowly turning purple in the face as all blood rushed to his head. This is insane, said Harry. What's got into... And then he saw the box lying open on Ron's bed, and the truth hit him with the force of a stampeding troll. <laughs> Where did you get those chocolate cauldrons? They were a birthday present, shouted Ron, re revolving slowly in midair as he struggled to get free. I offered you one, didn't I? You just picked them up off, them up off the floor, didn't you? They'd fallen off my bed, all right. Let me go. They didn't fall off your bed, you prat. Don't you understand? They were mine. I chucked them out of my trunk when I was looking for the map. They're the chocolate cauldrons Romilda gave me before Christmas, and they're all spiked with love potion! But only one word of this seemed to have registered with Ron. Romilda? He repeated. D did you say Romilda? Harry, do you know her? Can you introduce me? Harry stared at the dangling Ron, whose face now looked tremendously hopeful, and fought a strong desire to laugh. A part of him, the part closest to his throbbing right ear, was quite keen on the idea of letting Ron down and watching him run amok, amok until the effects of the potion wore off. But on the other hand, they were supposed to be friends. Ron had not been himself when he had attacked, and Harry thought that he would deserve another punching if he permitted Ron to declare undying love for Emilda Vane. Good, good friend. Do not do it. Yeah, I'll introduce you, said Harry, thinking fast. I'm going to let you down now, okay? He sent Ron crashing back to the floor. His ear did hurt quite a lot. But Ron, <laughs> but Ron simply bounded to his feet again, grinning. She'll, uh, she'll be in Slughorn's office, said Harry confidently, leading the way to the door. Oh, why will she be in, in there? asked Ron anxiously, hurrying to keep up. Oh, uh, she has extra potion lessons with him, said Harry, inventing wildly. Maybe I could ask if I can have them with her, oh, said Ron eagerly. Great idea, said Harry. Lavender was waiting beside the portrait hole, a, compli a complication Harry had not foreseen. Are you late, one one? She pouted. I got you a birthday. Leave me alone, <laughs> said Ron impatiently. Harry's going to introduce me to... <laughs> and without another word to her, he pushed his way out of the portrait hole. Harry tried to make an ap apologetic face to Lavender, but it might have turned out simply amused because she looked more offended than ever as the fat lady swung shut behind them. Harry had been slightly worried that Slughorn might be at breakfast. But he answered his office door at the first knock, 
wearing a green velvet dressing gown and matching a nightcap, matching nightcap and looking rather bleary-eyed. Oh, Harry, he mumbled. This is a very, uh, this is very early for a call. I generally sleep late on a Saturday. Professor, I'm really sorry to disturb you, said Harry as quietly as possible, while Ron stood on tiptoe, attempting to see past Slughorn into his room. My friend Ron swallowed a love potion by mistake. You couldn't make him an antidote, could you? I, 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 I'd, I'd take him to Madame Pomfrey, but we're not supposed to have anything from Weasley's wizard wheezes and, you know, awkward questions. I'd have thought you could have whipped him up a remedy, Harry, an expert potion here like you. Asked, asked Slughorn. Uh, said Harry, somewhat distracted by the fact that Ron was now elbowing him in the ribs in an attempt to force his way into the room. <laughs> well, I, I've never mixed an antidote for a love potion, sir, and by the time I get it ro right, Ron might have done something serious. Um, helpfully, Ron chose this moment to moan. Oh! <sighs> I can't see her, Harry! Is he hiding her? Was this portion within date? Asked Slughorn, now eyeing Ron with professional interest. I could strengthen, you know, the longer that they're, they're kept. That would explain a lot, panted Harry, now positively wrestling with Ron to keep him from knocking Slughorn over. It's his birthday, Professor, he added imploringly. Oh, all right, come in then, come in, said Slughorn, relenting. I've got the necessary, uh, necessary here in my bag. It's not a difficult uh, antidote. Ron burst through the door into Slughorn's overheated, crowded study, tripping over a tasseled footstool. Footstool regained his balance, balance by seizing Harry around the neck and muttered, <laughs> "Okay, seizing Harry." <laughs> this is really funny. Oh, he's like, oh. <laughs> Seizing Harry around the neck and muttered, Oh, she didn't see that, did she? She's not here yet, said Harry, watching Slughorn opening his potion kit and adding a few pinches of this and that to the small crystal bottle. That's good, said Ron fervently. How do I look? Very handsome, said Slughorn smoothly, handing Ron a glass of clear liquid. Nay, drink that up. It's a tonic for the nurse. Keep you calm when she arrives, you know. <sighs> Brilliant, said Ron eagerly, and he gulped the antidote down noisily. <laughs> Harry and Slughorn watched him. For a moment, Ron beamed at them. Then, very slowly, his grin sagged and vanished to be replaced by an expression of utmost horror. Ah, uh, so funny. Uh. Back to normal then, said Harry, grinning. Slughorn chuckled. Thanks a lot, Professor. Don't mention it, but my boy. Don't mention it, said Slughorn, as Ron collapsed into a nearby armchair, looking devastated. Pick me up. That's what he needs, Slughorn continued, now bustling over to a table loaded with drinks. I've got butter beer. I've got wine. Oh, I've got one, one, win, one, win. Last bottle of this oak matured mead. Hmm. Hit to give that to Dumbledore for Christmas. Oh, well, he shrugged. He can't miss what he's never had. <laughs> Why don't we open it now and celebrate Mr. Weasley's birthday? Nothing like a fine spirit to chase away the pangs of disappointed love. From an idiot, idiot, it's time for John's It's gonna be something in that mead. He's playing them. He's playing Harry. He's gonna do something to Harry with that mead. It's gonna it's gonna turn Harry into a walrus or something. <sighs> he chortled again and Harry joined in. <laughs> this was the first time he found himself almost alone with Slughorn since his 
disastrous first attempt to extract the two, true memory from him. Perhaps if he could just keep Slughorn in a good mood, perhaps they got through enough of the oak-matured mead. There you are, there you are then, said Slughorn, handing Harry and Ron a glass of mead each, before raising his own. Well, a very happy birthday, Ralph. Ron, whispered Harry. But Ron, who did not appear to be listening to the toast, had already thrown the mead into his mouth and swallowed it. There was one second, hardly more than a heartbeat, in which Harry knew there was something terribly wrong, and Slughorn, it seemed, did not. So I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. And may you have many more. Ron! Ron had dropped his glass. He half rose from his chair and then crumpled, his extremities jerking uncontrollably. Foam was dribbling from his mouth, and his eyes were bulging from their sockets. Professor! Harry bellowed. Do something! But Slug Slughorn seemed paralyzed by shock. Ron twitched and choked. His skin was turning blue. But what? But spluttered Hogwart, uh, uh, Slughorn. Hogwart. Uh, Harry leapt over. A, oh man, what's happening? Harry leapt over a low table and sprinted towards Slughorn's open potion kit. Pulled out jars and pouches, while the terrible sound of Ron's gargling breath filled the room. No! Then he found it. The shriveled, kidney-like stone Slughorn had taken from him in potions. He hurtled back to Ron's side, wrenched open his jaw, and thrust the bezhor into his mouth. Ron gave a great shudder, a rattling gasp, and his body became limp and still. End of chapter. Yowza! Ay, 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 What an anticlimactic way for Ron to go. I know he's not dead. There's no way that he's gonna die from that. Just, it's just not gonna happen. He, he would have, he, he would have had bigger moments before this, bigger emotional beats, for um, for uh, a second. I'm just trying try to turn on my fan because it's a bit hot in this uh, room. Okay, can you hear that fan? I hope it's not m messing up the mic. <laughs> I'm willing to give at Javoth one third potions for that premonition as the impact was to Ron, not Harry. And Slughorn appears confused by what's happening. Um, actually, I never said any of that. I just said that Ron's gonna crumple over and almost die. And Harry's gonna save him. Check the video. Go back five minutes. Sheesh, Lois. Sheesh. All right, chapter 19, Elf Tales. Oh, it is time. I need to end this. We need to see other people, everybody. We need to see other people. This has been great while it lasted today. Maybe tomorrow we can get back together. We'll see. No, I will be reading tomorrow. I will be reading tomorrow. Um, uh, We're ending on a cliffhanger. We're ending on a cliffhanger. We'll see where it goes tomorrow. Uh, that was, that was fun. I hope you have a good evening. I'm breaking up with the stream. No, Louis! Janessa, ma the denial is strong today. Also, no one became a walrus. I did, look at me. Uh, just another minute. Changing a relationship status now. <laughs> did you think about what are horcruxes? Maybe it's, um... Okay, okay. So I think one element, one element of a Horcrux is immediate death, okay? So I'm thinking immediate death. Now, how does that come about within the Horcrux? How would that come about, and why would Voldemort slash Draco and all these different evil people be interested in... Is Voldemort interested in it? Draco is, right? I think Draco is. Uh, why would they be interested in Horcruxes? I'm thinking it's immediate death. And, um, um, or maybe, maybe it's your, maybe, maybe, maybe your, oh, maybe your body dies, but your soul is trapped forever in torment. Maybe that's a horcrux. That would be more horrible than death. Maybe that. That's what my guess is. All right? That's what, that's what my guess is. Ah. Uh. Tom Riddle asked Slughorn about them. 
Vortimans, but we don't know what Drake was up to. Thank you, John, for today. Thank you, Barbara. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Walrus. <laughs> okay, friends. Uh, I will see you tomorrow again. We will continue this. Uh, I don't know, I don't know how far along we are, but... Uh, Oh, okay, we're on page 328 of... We're 60% done of this book. I thought we were further along, so there's still lots in this. Great. Uh, see you tomorrow. Have a wonderful day. Uh, and that's it. I'll leave you with my face. Bye-bye, Bill.